This may be the most terrifying title for a workshop that I've ever seen. Interrogation, analysis, charting, practical statistics, and worst of all, Excel. The only thing comforting in this title is the word geoscience. And if that didn't terrify you, then this project timeline should. Often our data comes too late and the deadlines come too soon. You're squeezed in the middle waiting on data loaders and then you're providing information to engineers, economists, and managers for project reviews. And you'll find that you're spending 50% of your time compiling, examining, and cleaning your data, which means you need to be accurate and efficient. So why take this course? You'll find that you'll be challenged by big data to be analyzed in little time. Big is a relative term. If you're working on a hand calculator, that might be 20 rows of data. But nowadays, in the petroleum industry, we're talking about millions of rows of data. For Excel, big means 500,000 to 750,000 rows of data, which make Excel slow. The formal definition of big data might be extremely large data sets that may be analyzed computationally to reveal patterns, trends, and association. Some of the key skills that you'll need to know about is data hygiene, data interrogation, data analysis, charting, and statistics that will lead to sound scientific and business decisions. By hygiene, we're talking about organizing and formatting the data for speedy and accurate analysis. Interrogation, quantifying and summarizing the scope and quality of the data. And analyzing and charting suggests an understanding of the correct statistical measures and graphical displays that lead to better business decisions. There are many other computer applications for geoscience that can do a better job and are more robust, such as SAS, R, MATLAB, Python, or Tableau. Some of these applications have steeper learning curves than Excel. And Excel can offer the abilities to do much of the analyses and is more readily accessible and easier to learn. This course is intended to reinforce your Excel skills with practical petroleum geology evaluations. This course consists of a mixture of lectures, tutorials, and exercises. The most important part of this course will be the exercises, and there will be six exercises. One on well header data, well tops, directional drilling survey, wireline logs, check shot surveys, and core analysis. And hopefully at the end we'll get to the group discussion and feedback. So the course is sort of a mixture to try to give you an exposure to petroleum geology data and methods in Excel on how to evaluate the data. Over the years, I've been reminded that Excel is not a database. And first blush, it looks like a database. Header records, rows, columns. And you can have text strings, numeric strings, but Relational databases have rules, strict rules, so you can't corrupt it. For example, you could never put this text string into a numeric column in a database. I'll let you read through the bullets here and let you know that there are limitations to size on Excel worksheets. So just keep this in mind. You can not corrupt your data, particularly when sorting. So you need to always keep a backup copy and be very careful what you do with Excel worksheets. Here's a slide looking at some of the basic rules for data format. And I'm comparing two tables, one bad and one good. So what is it about the bad one here? Well, let's look at it. We have some blank rows. We have duplicate header columns. We have a numeric field that's left justified and the API number that's right justified. This type of data structure is not very good for analyzing and charting data in Excel. So let's take a look at the good one. Well, first off, let's look at the, the names of the columns. Wellbore ID, no space. Wellbore name, no space. Depth, and we tell you what the units are in feet. You'll notice that numeric values are right justified. 
text strings are left justified. And the wellbore ID is reported here as a text string. And why? Because when you have these 14 digit codes, they're often converted to scientific notation in Excel, which isn't a very good thing. So, and we have one singular header. We have no blank rows. Let's talk a little bit about this unique wellbore identifier. You'll see a lot of this in the petroleum industry. Sometimes they call it the, well, the API number, sometimes the unique wellbore identifier, wellbore ID, Staco, Refno. They're all the same thing. It's a 14-digit code that's recommended by the American Petroleum Institute. It consists of a two-digit state code, a three-digit county code, a unique well identifier, sometimes called a refno. It's a sequential number. The first well drilled in a county is one, the second well is two, and so on. There's a sidetrack number and an event sequence code. So what's the difference between zero and null? It's something subtle but important. The distinction is between something measured with zero quantity or not measured at all. For example, let's consider this SP curve where its values can range from 100 to minus 200 and you have actual zero values where the curve crosses the zero reference line. And with subsea depth, you could have positive elevations or negative elevations and zero would be sea level, so another real value. Whereas where the curve was not recorded would be null. A typical problem is that zero and null values are not always distinguished when we receive databases. But there are important distinctions when we do mathematical operations. Excel spreadsheets treat blank cells as zero for the purpose of division, multiplication, addition, subtraction, and so forth. But they treat them like null values for some of the statistical measures, as we'll see in the following slide. Also, blank cells are often converted to zero when we convert Excel spreadsheets to other data platforms, like DBF or ArcGIS. So, the rule is, when you have real null values, we represent it with some value that is very unrealistic, like minus five nines. And for text strings, we would use unknown, UNKN. Sometimes we have cells that are filled in in our databases as the quantity was too small to measure, in which case we might use some really small value to replace it, like 0 0.00001. Okay, now that I've told you to put in these five nines here, negative five nines, I'm now going to be a, a hypocrite and tell you don't do it, and I'll show you why in the next slide. In this slide, we'll demonstrate Excel's treatment of zero and null values. So we receive some data with name, count, and value. And here we have blank records highlighted in yellow, and in one of them I've put a null val the value null in it. And in the other table here, I've replaced those cells with zeros. And I've done a series of division, multiplication, subtraction, addition, and log 10. And we'll see that when you have the null values, it treats it like a zero. That says that division is undefined. And it treated the other values as zero. And the log value is an undefined operation. Where it had the null, everything, it just it can't do anything because it thinks it's a text string. So if you had something like less than one, this is what you would get. And when we've done the zeros, you still pretty much get the same result. So those are the mathematical operations. Now let's look at the statistical. So in the blanks, we have a sum of 45 for the value, same, same. The average, you'll see, is 7.5. So it recognized these as null values. And here, it used the zero in calculating the average. The count is 6, the count is 10. Again, it saw them as null values. Here the min is 5, so it saw it as null values. And here the min is 0, so it saw it as a real value. 
So the distinction is that for mathematical arithmetic operations, it's functionally a zero. For statistical operations, it's either a null or a zero. I've added the slides so that we could at least have a common language when we talk about the jargon of what's on an Excel spreadsheet. So let's go over these things. So we have the quick access toolbar at the top. We have tabs or main menus here. We call these ribbons. So each item on the main menu has a ribbon. This is the formula bar and the name box. These are worksheet tabs down at the bottom and this area down here is the status bar where you can display key statistical measures for your data. For more information I recommend this website which can explain these different ribbons.